Medical Surgery Fellow at Cohen Children's Medical Center. Uh, today I'll be presenting on behalf of the Pediatric Surgery Research Collaborative on the Minimally Invasive Pylonidal Excision for the Treatment of Pylonidal Disease, a multicenter prospective trial. We did this research as pylonidal disease significantly affects quality of life of our patients, and I'm presenting one of the first prospective pediatric trials. Uh, I have no disclosures. Pylonidal disease is a disease of pylonidal skin pits and sinuses that trap hair and cause infections and cause pain and decrease quality of life. Traditionally, wide local excision and flap closure techniques were the standard of care. However, more recently, minimally invasive pylonidal excision techniques pioneered by Dr. Gipps has gained popularity in adults. In initial pediatric literature has shown uh, the technique to be effective as well in the pediatric population. With trephination of skin pits and curatage of the sinus tracts, a significantly less invasive option provides a decreased morbidity from the procedures prior, potentially at the cost of higher recurrence rates. We performed a multi-institutional prospective trial specifically to address the recurrence rates for minimally invasive pylonidal excision in the pediatric population. We enrolled from six children's hospitals around the country uh, for in a prospective observational manner from January 2019 to January, June 2022 for all patients undergoing pylonidal excisions under the age of 25 years of age. The procedure of choice was non-randomized and up to the patient and surg surgeon's preference. Exclusion criteria included simple INDs of the abscesses and significant medical comorbidities including cancer, diabetes, chronic steroid use, as well as immunosuppression that would compromise wound healing. Our primary outcomes were the rate of second operative procedure within six months of initial procedure, and our secondary outcomes uh, included rates of secondary operative procedures up to two years and factors associated with the recurrence. Our results showed a total of 150 patients enrolled with a median age of 16 years of age. 55% uh, of patients were male with one occurrence of pylonidal disease prior to the index surgical procedure. The majority of patients underwent a minimal and minimally invasive pylonidal excision at 83% and 17% of patients underwent a minimal excision with modifications. One patient underwent a complex excision as the index procedure. In terms of recurrence, the majority of patients received a uh, minimal excision. Uh, in terms of recurrence, 145 patients uh, had at least one follow-up with a median follow-up of 186 days, uh, and 40 patients total required a second procedure for a rate of 27%. Approximately half of the recurrences occurred within the first six months at a rate of 21%, with an additional six and 10 patients requiring additional procedures at one year and two years follow-up. The majority of patients received another minimal excision as their second procedure, and uh, six patients underwent a modified minimal excision, while three patients underwent simple INDs and three patients underwent more complex excision and flap closures. Secondary analysis of factors associated with occurrence showed that there's no significant difference in demographics between the two groups. The number of prior episodes of pylonidal disease, uh, gender, age, height, weight, BMI, and race and ethnicity were all similar between the two groups. Interestingly, hair density, which is measured as a standardized pictorial chart, was significantly higher in the recurrent group. And the lack of discharge antibiotics uh, was associated, while in small numbers, uh, with recurrence as well. Hair diameter, number of pits, number of punches, hair pulled from the pits, perioperative antibiotics, as well as infection present, present at the time of index surgery, and type of irrigant solution used was not significantly associated with the recurrence. In conclusion, among participating centers and surgeons, the minimally invasive pylonidal excision was the preferred procedure for pylonidal disease, both as the initial procedure and for occurrence. Recurrent, uh, recurrence and need for reoperation at six months was 21%, with longer term follow up showing total recurrence rate of 27%. While hair density and discharge antibiotics may be associated with need for reoperation, further studies are needed. Thank you for your time.
Thank you so much. Very crisp presentation. We, we do have some time for questions. If anybody has questions, please come up to a microphone, identify your name and the institution. Uh, Tim Lass from Chicago, Larry Children's. Um, what about post-operative, like, clinic care? They often will get, like, some granulation tissue and stuff. Is there any guidance for how we should be managing that? Should we be silver nitrating it? Is there topical agents we should be using to help make sure that these things heal effectively? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, for the post-operative care, we have clinic visit notes, um, and certainly we didn't include the data of the granulation tissue that required any kind of silver nitrate. Um, some people used some silver dressings for small uh, beds that had opened up, and there's no real standardization yet. I think it's up to the local surgeon and the degree of the dehiscence or degree of granulation tissue that's present, but certainly the options that you kind of mentioned in terms of the silver nitrate or any kind of silver dressing um, is uh, used often. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Next, I'd like to welcome to the podium Dr. Stephen Papastefan, who's a surgery resident from Northwestern University. The title of his talk will be Kicking the Can Down the Road, Overnight Decision Making for Equivocal Appendicitis Often Involves Unnecessary Hospital Admissions. Thank you for the opportunity to present. I have no disclosures. Clinical irradiographic features of appendicitis are frequently uncertain, and the diagnosis of appendicitis can be challenging for equivocal cases, marred by atypical signs and symptoms, reassuringly normal labs, and uncertain imaging. The decision to operate can be made either empirically accepting the possibility of performing a negative appendectomy, or after a variable period of observation where declarative symptoms may or may not develop. The overnight management of appendicitis presents unique challenges, such as operating room availability limiting overnight uh, operations and service staff staffing by t trainees who may be reluctant to send certain patients home overnight. In our hospital, we observed a sort of circadian rhythm for the management of equivocal append appendicitis, whereby patients are often admitted um, for observation for an ultimate determination to be made by the morning team, whereas this phenomenon did not seem to occur as often during the day. So we did this study to characterize the benefits and harms of hospital observation admissions occur occurring overnight, uh, given the considerable cost of managing equivocal cases and for the opportunity to selectively reduce resource utilization for certain patients. With this, we hypothesize that most cases of equivocal appendicitis admitted overnight would be subsequently discharged home, in contrast to other studies that demonstrate a relatively high rate of identifying appendicitis in observed equivocal cases. And, for the, um, and our second hypothesis was that the option to discharge can more often be determined based on the presenting clinical data for these patients. To test this hypothesis, we did a single institution uh, retrospective review of patients presenting between 2021 and 2023 of patients evaluated by the Pediatric Surgery Service for potential appendicitis during the overnight shift. We defined equivocal, equivocal appendicitis as imaging not definitively positive or negative um, or imaging and clinical discordances determined by the overnight consultant. And our primary outcome was disposition after initial evaluation, as well as the appendectomy um, rate within 30 days and negative appendectomy rate. We excluded patients who had received antibiotics at an outside hospital or prior to consultation, and those with, uh, with immunocompromised status and IBD. And here were the relevant statistics that we performed. Of our 517 patients who were evaluated for potential appendicitis overnight, we included 79 in our analysis after excluding five patients who received antibiotics prior to consultation. 54% of these patients were admitted for observation, and 45% were discharged from the emergency department. Of the 43 who were admitted for observation, 10 eventually underwent appendectomy, and 77% of patients were eventually or discharged home. Seven uh, were diagnosed with appendicitis on final pathology, and three of them were negative appendectomies. Of the 36 patients who were initially discharged from the emergency department, one patient underwent a negative, uh, an appendectomy, which was negative, and then 35 required no further surgical care. 
Looking at the differences in patients who did not have appendicitis, we found that weight percentile, a higher weight percentile, a shorter duration of symptoms, and a higher Alvarado score of factors associated with admission. Ultrasound uh, was equivocal in um, over 90% of patients in both admitted and discharged, and MRI and CT were obtained more often, 72% in admitted patients versus 56% of patients in the discharged group. And looking at those patients um, who had uh, true appendicitis, their Alvarado score on presentation was significantly higher, and there was no difference in weight percentile, and actually the majority of patients had symptoms for a longer duration. Uh, looking at uh, Alvarado score as a, as a predictor of appendicitis, we found a moderate predictive um, uh, value of Alvarado score uh, based on the AOC, AUC of our ROC curve, and our optimal cutoff point was five. In fact, 43% of those patients uh, with an Alvarado score of less than five were uh, admitted to the hospital, and none of them had appendicitis. The maximum specificity of our model was eight, and if we had made the decision to discharge all patients with an Alvarado score of less than eight, we would have been correct 93% of the time. So in conclusion, children with equivocal findings admitted overnight are most often discharged home from the hospital, and in this series, no patients who are discharged home eventually developed appendicitis. Many patients admitted overnight could have likely been discharged safely based on features present at the time of ED consultation, and more often, overnight decisions can be dichotomized as either sending them to the operating room or home um, with, uh, with um, admission observations more selectively reserved for those patients um, who have a higher likelihood of truly representing appendicitis. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hi, David Rothstein, Seattle Children's. Um, what do you think drives the decision to keep a patient overnight? Sometimes it's parents don't feel like going home. Sometimes it's a CT scan is an option and they don't like that idea. Sometimes it's that the attending's at home and doesn't want to get out of bed or whatever. So did you have any information about why those decisions were made? Yeah, I think that that is, um, you know, what we really need to look at next. Um, there are multiple factors. So if a patient is from far away, um, you may be less likely to send that patient home because it may mean that they have to drive further. Um, I have a sense that there is probably some difference in the way that radiology reports are, um, are written that probably plays into this a little bit too. So something can be kind of phrased as more of a strong, I'd say equivocal, um, as higher likelihood potentially um, as, you know, as compared to one that's kind of less likely. Um, but I think that's where we have to use our clinical discretion. And I think, you know, on the whole, there were many, many patients that had a pretty low presenting Alvarado score that were just admitted, um, uh, you know, not necessarily for, for a great reason. Hi, Sam Sofer from New York. Um, I like this paper a lot. Um, I, the one thing that's concerning to me is in the data, and it's hard to parse out, it's just too much of a coincidence that seven out of the 10 patients that stayed overnight ultimately had appendicitis zero out of the patients who sat home. So were the kids who stayed overnight maybe a little less equivocal? So the, so the kids who were admitted had a slightly higher Alvarado score overall. So yes, I mean, that would indicate that there were some patients that were probably in that cohort that um, had a higher likelihood, you know, uh, preemptively uh, of having appendicitis. Um, but a 30% negative appendectomy rate is relatively high too. So, um, you know, patients, it seems like just they're, by being admitted to the hospital are probably more likely to undergo an appendectomy anyways, as opposed to those patients who are discharged home, maybe had symptoms for another 24 to 48 hours and then never needed an operation. Maybe I'll ask you a question in the last 30 seconds we have. So looking at your data, you would have still sent seven patients home if, if it was just dichotomous that had appendicitis. And I think, you know, a lot of the ER doctors really fear that. That's what they do not want to do. So were you able to use this data to re-amend uh, your, your pathway to screen these patients better so you do not send patients home who have yeah. appendicitis? Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. And so I, I, I kind of had another slide in terms of a proposed pathway, but I think that um, what we show is that anyone less than an Alvarado score of five can probably be safely discharged home. 
anyone with an Alvarado score of greater than or equal to eight probably should be admitted um, and observed overnight. But those people in the middle is where, where I think we can use kind of our clinical discretion um, and probably, you know, more heavily weighting towards the, the uh, discharge, I'd say, than an observation for most patients. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's 2024 and we're still trying to figure out appendicitis. We will continue for some time to come. The next paper is the integration of care for pediatric patients with gastrostomy tubes. It will be presented by Dr. Andrew Modriak from a surgery resident from New York Presbyterian, Will Cordell. Good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew and I'll be presenting an initiative focused on integration of care for pediatric patients with gastrostomy tubes. I have no competing interests to disclose. We did this project because we noticed that our previous asynchronous care model for pediatric G2 patients resulted in increased office visits and missed appointments. And so in response to this, we implemented a novel synchronous care model for our G2 patients. And it's important because it resulted in improved care coordination, less redundancy, fewer office visits, fewer missed office visits, and fewer G2 related ED visits. To provide some more background, our pediatric G2 patients comprise approximately 20% of all of our pediatric surgical outpatient visits. And more than 90% of G2 patients were followed every six to 12 weeks for more than 18 months. Our patients had on average of four preoperative visits in separate locations with multiple providers, as well as separate visits for post-op follow-ups. It's difficult to coordinate all these visits with our patient population. They had to travel up to 6.1 miles in between sites, which may not sound like that much, but most of our patients don't have access to a car and there's a limited public transportation in this area of New York City. In addition, 66% of patients required 10 weeks of preoperative care coordination. Other issues include a 15% office no-show rate, no formal patient education in our office encounters, and we notice increased direct and indirect costs for patients, such as clinic and transportation expenses, as well as time taken off work for parents and off school for patients. There are also increased G2-related ED visits, risk of malnutrition, and delayed nutritional development. Our intervention featured, as I said, a novel synchronous care model, and we implemented it and followed it over a one-year period. The new model had multiple specialists consolidated into one co-localized space, and the separate visits became one simultaneous visit with the surgeon, gastroenterologist, and feeding therapist. We implemented a new pre-intake huddle to coordinate care and added additional family education. I'll talk more about the pre-intake huddle momentarily. We included 21 patients in this study, and we compared outcomes of one year prior to the intervention to the year, uh, one year after the intervention. We looked at physical appointments, missed visits, G2-related ED visits, billable encounters, and billable procedures. This was our clinic flow prior to the intervention. To walk you through it, first the patient checked in with the registrar, registered, and insurance referrals and guardianship presence were all confirmed. They then waited until intake with the medical assistant, and afterwards they were sent back to the waiting room until their physician visit. Then they checked out and follow-up was scheduled. The steps in this green box is where we identify the biggest opportunity for improvement to address inefficiencies and improve patient flow, as this is where most holdups related to patient authorization and provider referrals occurred. This is our post-clinic flow, post-intervention clinic flow. So that pre-visit huddle I mentioned earlier is what all the boxes on the left are. We had a team of nurses, schedulers, doctors, and medical assistants all meet one week prior to the first patient visit in order to verify insurance, obtain necessary referrals, confirm the appointment, make sure a guardian was going to be there, and verify availability of supplies as necessary. After the patient came in and registered, they waited again until intake with the medical assistant. Immediately after intake, though, they met with their physicians and specialists all in one room simultaneously, and then they checked out and scheduled follow-up as usual. It's important to point out that the simultaneous visit reduced time spent in clinic, avoided redundancies, and prevented inconsistencies in counseling. It's also important to note that after intake with the medical assistant, the patient no longer needed to return to the waiting room, which reduced non-interactive wait time. This table demonstrates the results. Uh, it shows our number of encounters pre and post intervention, and the total number of physical visits went down by 57%, missed appointments were down by 86%, and G2-related ED visits went down by 87%. We maintained our billable encounters and procedures, importantly. This bar graph demonstrates a statistically significant reduction in the mean number of in-person visits, missed visits, and ED visits. And again, billable encounters and procedures were maintained, indicating that fewer physical visits does not lead to a reduction in reimbursement for care. 
so the limitations of the study is that it was a single sample, uh, single site, a small sample size, and two months of our study overlapped with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and aside from the limitations, some key take home points are um, that the synchronous model reduces wait time in clinic and can be particularly important for those who um, may have limitations in social status um, and transportation issues. Thank you, I'll take any questions. Thank you so much. There are some chairs for those standing. There's a bunch of chairs in the front rows here. If you would like to come, you're more than welcome to come and take those chairs. Questions? So maybe um, I'll ask you to take a bit of a step back. Um, how did you actually put this multidisciplinary group together to initiate this? Right, so it occurred during a time of sort of luck, essentially. We had a new clinic opening up that was a co space with multiple specialists. So our surgeons and gastroenterologists would share the space. And they had some overlap in their availability for clinic. And so it required a lot of coordination beforehand for all the specialists to meet and choose a time that works for all of them. And so, again, it was a very um, forward-thinking process of identifying a time that works for everybody, identifying the appropriate patients for this clinic, and then making it happen once the clinic opened. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Hi, I'm Simone dundas Vaz from the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. Um, great paper. I wanted to ask at the level of the attendings or the person who runs the clinic, did you get pushback or were they willing to? Because in, in my mind, they would have my clinic is Thursday mornings and that's the time I've carved out of my schedule. To make it a more patient-focused, patient-centered thing is a paradigm shift. From the top, did you get resistance? Right, and that's a very good question. Um, it, it was difficult to coordinate schedules, and I think that a lot of the resistance came from that. And like I said, we got lucky that the schedules already overlapped. The thing that helped us overcome that challenge is within each specialty, we identified a champion to sort of discuss among their members um, and find time and a way that it works for their group. And that's kind of how we brought everybody together. That, that faculty champion was a key player in the situation. Excellent. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Emmanuel Ababrizi, from, who's a research fellow at Children's Wisconsin. His work is titled Facilitating the Use of Same-Day Discharge After Appendectomy in Children, Implementation of an Evidence-Based Post-Operative Pathway. Thank you for the opportunity to present. I have no disclosures. So the reason we did this work is same-day discharge after appendectomy improves the value of care for children with uncomplicated appendicitis. It leads to decreased cost of care, decreased length of stay, without an increase in returns, unexpected returns to the hospital in ED visits and readmissions. As such, we wanted to use quality improvement methodology, specifically Lean Six Sigma, to improve the utilization of same-day discharge at our institution. I'm presenting this work because our approach can inform other institutions' of, um, initiatives to improve patient care and value as well. Talking a little bit about the approach, we use Lean Six Sigma because it helps to make processes more efficient while adding value. Specifically, DMAIC involves defining a problem, measuring its impact, analyzing the factors that contribute to it, developing an improvement strategy, and in the control phase, coming up with alterations to what's already going on to improve the positive results that are already being seen. In our case, we define same-day discharge as a target for quality improvement. We then measured our same-day discharge utilization in a retrospective review that's published. And in the analysis phase, we, we looked at the barriers that were existing to same-day discharge. So in this published work from our institution, we found that between 2015 and 2019, same-day discharge was about 18% overall. And in 2019, it was up about 35%. The barriers to same-day discharge utilization where travel time more than 30 minutes from the hospital, time of surgery after 12 p.m., and socioeconomic status measured by area deprivation index. Specifically, patients who had surgery um, after 12 p.m., patients who lived more than 30 minutes away from the hospital, 
And for every decile increase in area deprivation index, there's a less likelihood of same day discharge as well. So to improve, a multidisciplinary team created a new pathway to facilitate same day discharge, targeting those barriers in order to improve our, our use. This team was made up of people from surgery, nursing, and hospital leadership. Some of the main areas they addressed were one, decreasing the time from presentation to the operating room. For cases that were added on, if it was presumed to be uncomplicated appendicitis, we scheduled those to go earlier in the day. We also addressed social barriers to same day discharge by talking with families, finding out what the barriers would be to leaving and going home. Um, and also we implemented a consistent discharge criteria to make sure that if patients met that criteria, there wasn't any subjective decision making from other members of the team to keep them. Finally, there was a policy change to allow patients to discharge from the recovery area without returning to their inpatient rooms. Of note, during the formation of this pathway, um, there were COVID-19 modifications to our perioperative protocols. So for instance, COVID testing increased our preoperative time, but there was also a simultaneous concerted effort to discharge patients home as soon as possible to minimize exposure. After the pathway was created, we disseminated this by email, meetings, and our pediatric surgery grand rounds, and we implemented it in April of 2021. In the control phase, we reevaluated our progress, shared experience and feedback on how we can continue to improve. So our pre-implementation same-day discharge rate was about 52%. This went up to 83% after implementation. Of note, our median post-operative length of stay went from 10.6 hours to 4.9 hours. And the median hospital charges decreased by about $900 as well. For our balancing measures of ED visits, readmissions, outside hospital visits, we found that they were all about the same. Um, this graph shows same-day discharge utilization and percentage over time. The blue line represents patients who had surgery before 12 p.m. The orange line represents patients who had surgery after 12 p.m. One key time point is project initiation at, at the beginning of 2020. That also coincided with the declaration of COVID-19 as a pandemic. As you can see, at that time point, same-day discharge utilization went up and continued to stay up. Pathway implementation happened in April of 2021, and the re-evaluation period happened in April of 2022. Because of the confounding effect of the pandemic on our results, we did a multivariable uh, analysis and adjusted for the pandemic. And what we found was in the post-implementation period, same-day discharge utilization went up by about 76%. But overall, during the COVID period, same-day discharge utilization was overall about three times higher than it was before. So in conclusion, we successfully used a multidisciplinary approach and QI methodology to increase same-day discharge utilization after appendectomy. And in so doing, we noticed also a decreased length of stay, over 50%. We also decreased the median charges as well. And finally, we didn't see an increase in unexpected returns to the hospital in ED visits and readmissions. With that, thank you, and I'll take any questions. Hi, Lauren Berman from uh, Nemours in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, really great study. I appreciate how you looked at the differences according to the area deprivation index. Um, I think that's something we don't do enough. We're doing QI to look at those types of disparities. Uh, I'm wondering if you could give a little bit more detail about you know, how you ask questions about social barriers and what you did to overcome them. And then also, did you see that disparity get mitigated in your post-implementation phase. You showed us that the, the timing of the API, you know, increased discharge after noon, but did you see the, a similar thing with the ADI? Yes, um, so to answer your first question, in the published retrospective study, we used geocoding to um, look at census tract data and have ADI information, but we didn't have that for the second study. Um, in order to find out barriers to discharge, we set expectations early on as early as in consultation with the ED to tell them that if it's uncomplicated appendicitis, you're likely to discharge on the same day. And as part of the admissions process, um, nurses screen for issues with transportation going home. Um, so that's how we, we navigated that. If there were any issues, then there was a social work consult placed to help with that. Thank you. You're welcome. One more quick question. Thanks yes. very much, uh, Matt Santori from Atlanta. Um, I'm really impressed with your outcomes, but how do you plan on maintaining them over time? 
Yes, um, one key thing we did was create order sets um, and educate residents who were coming on service who had most variability in patient care. Um, and all the APPs were also familiar with the order sets and um, the plan for same-day discharge. And so after, um, first off, during the surgery, towards the end, once it's, complete, once it's determined to be uncomplicated appendicitis, the surgeon talks to the charge nurse and the circulator to get ready for same-day discharge um, to prepare the recovery area for that process as well. And so that's already built into the operative side of things. And when you place in orders, there's the opportunity to then click um, same-day discharge pathway and that helps to expedite things in that direction as well. So I think the order set, resident training, and the culture that's being built into the operative room um, processes all help um, sustain this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next study is a, a retrospective analysis of perioperative nausea and emesis based on preoperative NPO time in pediatric patients with appendicitis and will be presented by Lindsay Keynes, a medical student and future physician. We have Lindsay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present our work. We have no disclosures. So nausea and emesis are common perioperative complaints among patients with appendicitis. And this has led some providers to recommend NPO times for solid food to be longer than eight hours. There's long been debate over the best practice guidelines for preoperative fasting in pediatric patients. And much of this debate stems from concerns over slow GI transit time in abdominal pathologies, including appendicitis. ERAS guidelines encourage minimizing preoperative fasting times when possible for patients, especially without active nausea or emesis. This stems from research suggesting negative outcomes associated with these increased fasting times, including increased pain scores, dehydration, hypoglycemia, irritability, and increased risk of hemodynamic instability. Ultimately, preoperatively, patients fall into two groups prior to an appendectomy, either NPO for a regular diet at the time of admission or NPO at the time or at midnight prior to their surgery we sought to analyze whether there's a difference in perioperative nausea and emesis based on timing of preoperative NPO orders. And we were motivated to conduct this research because appendicitis is so common, and we hope to contribute to the optimization of perioperative care in hopes of improving patient comfort and outcomes. Our study was a retrospective chart review, including pediatric patients undergoing non-elective appendectomy between May 2014 and December 2019. Patients were grouped according to the time of their NPO for solid food order, either NPO at midnight or NPO on admission. For the purposes of our study, we considered NPO orders at 1159, 12 o'clock, or 1201 to be our NPO at midnight group, and any other time of NPO order was classified as NPO on admission. We did not analyze time of clear liquid NPO orders but we do acknowledge that some patients were allowed clear liquid for longer. The primary outcomes of our study included pre- and post-operative nausea and vomiting, as well as emesis with anesthesia induction and aspiration with anesthesia induction. This info was gathered from the ED notes, H&Ps, nursing notes, I's and O's, anesthesia notes, and progress notes to ensure comprehensive data collection. There were a total of 617 patients included in our analysis, 91 in the NPO at midnight group, and 526 in the NPO at other time group. We analyzed factors such as sex, race, age, weight, and BMI, and found no differences in demographic characteristics between the groups. Our patients' ages ranged from 1 to 18 years. In terms of perioperative outcomes, there were no differences in pre-op nausea or emesis, and no differences in rates of emesis with induction. Notably, we only had one recorded case of ASP or emesis with induction in the NPO on admission group, and no documented cases of aspiration during this time period. We did observe significant differences in total NPO time, with about 12 and a half hours for the NPO at midnight group, and 14.7 hours in the NPO on admission group. 
We also saw significantly reduced post-op nausea and emesis in the NPO at midnight group. While this did not specifically correlate with reductions in post-op ileus or length of hospital stay, we do surmise that this would increase patient comfort. I also wanted to mention our key limitations of this study. Namely, it was a retrospective study, so there was potential for selection bias, and we were not able to evaluate the timing of allowing clear liquids up to two hours before, which we plan to address in a future study. So in conclusion, for patients admitted for next day appendectomy without active nausea or emesis, NPO orders for regular diet at midnight versus on admission allow for shorter overall NPO times when compared to the NPO orders on admission. We also found no increased risk of emesis or aspiration with induction of anesthesia, thus suggesting that this option is just as safe as the standard. We also found decreased post-operative nausea and emesis in patients who were made NPO at midnight compared to NPO on admission, which we presume would correlate with increased patient comfort during their recovery. Thank you so much. I'll be happy to take questions. So Lindsay, before we take questions, I'll have to apologize. My notes here said you're a medical student, but I see that you've gotten your degree already, so congratulations. That was a couple weeks ago, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful start to your career. Go ahead. Hi, Jonathan Kohler from UC Davis uh, in Sacramento. Uh, really interesting study, and I think just goes to show that 99% of what we do in pediatric surgery is appendicitis and then arguing about it. Um, the, um, the question I have is, are you, is it, is it your standard practice to keep patients NPO before an appendectomy at your place? Like, is it, is it the general rule that they will have some sort of NPO period? Because we do rapid sequence induction and treat it as an emergent case the vast majority of the time, although obviously if they come in overnight, then they get an operation the next day. So there's a lot of variation in that practice. Um, and I do think in 50 years, like everyone will think this NPO period is a benighted practice and they'll just be bladder scanning people's stomachs. But um, we're not there yet, so how, how are you doing it at your place? I think a lot of it depends on kind of availability of OR time. So like some patients who you're able to squeeze in in the afternoon or shortly after they're present, like presenting to the ER, um, they'll sometimes do it more emergently, treat it more as an RSI case. But for patients who are staying overnight with the plan to operate tomorrow, we do usually keep them NPO, either at midnight or at time of admission, depending on their initial presentation and symptoms, whether they have active nausea or not. I have to say I found this study fascinating. We actually have a, an international ERAS group working through the ERAS Society right now to create appendicitis ERAS uh, guidelines. And we searched this, we, there was no guidelines. I mean, I think this is what, maybe one of the first studies to actually ask this question. And it's a surgical dictum that we all think once we diagnose appendicitis, we make a patient MPO. And in fact, it challenges the notion that these patients are all anorexic. Many of them are hungry and they wanna have a big burger while they're waiting for their appendectomy, and there's really no reason not to let them eat, as you showed. So I think this is actually very important data. Thank you so much. <clears throat> the next presentation is Pause the Repeat, evaluating the efficacy of repeat imaging in transferred pediatric patients with suspected appendicitis. This will be presented by Dr. Mona Lisa Hassan, who is a research fellow at UC Davis Medical Center. Good morning, thank you for having me today. We have nothing to disclose. We did this research because our current treatment algorithms for patients who are transferred with suspected appendicitis rely on re-imaging almost all of our patients. In our institution, we wondered if this was necessary. This is important because repeat imaging adds time, expense, and radiation exposure to patients. So like I said, we did this research to evaluate the efficacy of repeat imaging, which is common practice at our facility. First, we wanted to know what are our re-imaging practices? How many patients do we re-image? And are we repeating the same imaging modality or are we doing something else? Often the timeline starts with evaluation at the referring center with either ultrasound or CT, followed by transfer and re-evaluation at the accepting facility. How long do patients wait in the emergency department and does this delay a surgery that would have been inevitable? Lastly, we ask why are we re-imaging? Are our imaging results more accurate than that of the transferring facility and is that due to the modality or something else? 
The overall question is, can we rely on the diagnostic imaging from referring centers to make surgical decisions? We started with 613 patients representing transfers to our quaternary referral center for appendicitis with pre-transfer imaging of either a CT or ultrasound. We collected data from September of 2017 to July of 2023. Of these patients, only 24 of them were not re-imaged before surgery, which represents only 4%. The vast majority, 96%, did have another image before going on to their intervention. So now we want to look at the trends in our imaging. So for patients who came with the CT, there were 436 patients that were initially evaluated by CT, and of them, five patients had surgery without any re-imaging or reinterpretation. One patient was re-imaged with a second CT, and 11 patients had an ultrasound after they were transferred. The majority of patients were evaluated with the CT overread, where an in-house radiologist rereads the same image. While this avoids more radiation for the patient, this does add time. We see here that it takes upwards of an hour to repeat an image, even if it's an overread of an existing image. That takes about an hour and a half to so two hours to the ED average dwell time. The in-house radiologists however, agree with the transfer read 95% of the time. I do want to note that of these 419 patients who were transferred with the CT, they got an initial ultrasound at the transferring facility, then a CT scan, and then were transferred to us for further evaluation. 176 patients were initially evaluated with an ultrasound alone before transfer. 125 of those patients were re-imaged with an ultrasound, and we agreed with the diagnosis of appendicitis 89% of the time. Seven patients received an ultrasound after getting, I'm sorry, received a CT after coming with an ultrasound, and only 19 of patients did not receive a second image before surgery. This is actually a higher percent of patients going to surgery without re-imaging or reinterpretation compared to the CT group. 11% of patients who came with an ultrasound didn't have any re-imaging or reinterpretation, whereas only 1% of patients who came with a CT went straight to surgery without getting re-imaged. This may be because our institution doesn't reread ultrasounds done elsewhere. There were then 25 patients who had an ultrasound. The ultrasound was then repeated and found to be inconclusive, and so they then received a CT scan, um, and this took the longest time. Again, it took about three hours for patients without re-imaging to go on to the next step, um, whether that was a drain or the operating room, and we added at least two hours of a ED dual time for any other imaging. So it seems that when we re-image a patient, our results agree with the imaging the majority of the time with the transferring facility, but we also want to know, obviously, the accuracy of their imaging and our imaging. So we found that the sensitivity of the images coming from a referring center was 93%, and the sensitivity of the repeat imaging was 96%. This means that while we are increasing the ED dwell time by upwards of two hours at minimum to either re-image or to reinterpret an existing image, Compared with going straight to intervention using the initial image, we're only increasing the sensitivity of the diagnostic test by 3%. Um, our study is limited in that we can't capture true negatives with our study design, so a specificity calculation is impossible. A patient who is deemed to be negative at any point of this um, study could have been discharged and they could have gone to another hospital and found to have appendicitis and maybe they were a positive. Um, we also don't have numbers for the true negatives, so an abdominal pain who came and was found to be true negative at an outside hospital. We can conclude, however, that the sensitivity with re-imaging only increases by 3%, and we're adding at least two hours, if not sometimes very much more than two hours, to the ED dwell time for these patients, and that is a significant increase. One further point will be to look into trends um, based on a referring center to referring center basis to identify opportunities for collaborative quality improvement and agreed upon imaging practices between especially the centers who are frequently transferring patients um, to our um, quaternary care center. Um, I want to say thank you to um, especially the uh, pediatric surgery department at UC Davis and Dr. Kohler for mentorship throughout this project, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Stephen Lee, um, Seattle Children's. Great presentation, uh, great work.
question is, did the dwell time increase the time to the operation? Yeah, it's a little bit hard to get that granular with um, the way that the times are sometimes set up in the chart. Um, we decided on ED dwell time. Oftentimes, that does mean they've gone from the ED to the operating room. It could mean that they went to IR or that they went to the floor. Um, um, but it's hard to tell exactly when the, the operation starts. There's also a lot of factors that are outside of the realm of whether or not they got re-imaged as to why they didn't go straight to the operating room. For example, if the operating room is backed up or there are other emergency cases, we didn't want that to um, show up in our data as a reason for um, to blame the imaging for that delay when there are a lot of reasons for why someone doesn't go straight to the operating room. So that's why we use the ED dwell time as opposed to when they got their operation. And, and really quickly, a, a comment. I'm glad you're working with your surrounding communities because the CT scan as a first image of I, uh, is, seems to be very, very high. I was very surprised by that as well, yes. Thank you. Uh, Mark Cashton, Loma Linda University Children's. Um, in the group that had a, came in with a CT and then uh, underwent repeat imaging, did you break out uh, patients who had contrasted versus non-contrasted CTs? Because what we see very frequently as a center with something like 80% of transfer API volume is that very frequently our community partners send us non-contrast CTs, which in the case of a very obvious appendix is diagnostic, but very frequently is not. That's an excellent question. I will be happy to look into that because we didn't parse that apart, but that's a great next step. That's a good idea. Thank you. Hey, Sean from Boston. Is this on? Sean from Boston. I was wondering, and I may have missed this, do you guys use MRIs for the screening of appendicitis or were those, were those patients excluded? And by any chance for future studies, are you planning to look on maybe the negative appy rate for those patients that don't get re-imaging and if that plays a role? <clears throat> Um, yeah, so in terms of MRI, um, we didn't have a lot of patients who, who got an MRI for an um, initial screen, and our study was specifically looking at CT and ultrasound and re-imaging. I imagine it would be very rare to repeat an MRI. Um, and then um, for your second question, looking at the negative. Yeah, the negative APNE rate, so those patients that don't get a second imaging and just go straight to surgery. I wonder if those patients maybe have a higher negative appy rate or compared to those that do get re-imaging. Yeah, we, certainly we can parse that out in the paper. The sensitivity was pretty high. We used the gold standard of pathology for the patients who went to the operating room um, to use the, do the sensitivity calculation. So that's using the path. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I can make this quick. Hi, uh, Doug Miniotti from Kaiser Permanente, Roseville, your neighbor uh, across the way. Thanks a lot for presenting this information and, and demonstrating one of the tenets of residency and uh, surgery in general, which is trust but verify. You clearly have shown that it's not actually necessary in the majority of cases. My question is simply, has knowledge of this information, anecdotally at least, changed your local practice uh, for you and Jonathan? Yeah, uh, maybe not yet. Um, <laughs> this is the first time I'm presenting this, so uh, we hope so. To your point about um, trust but verify, I think you know there's different ways that you can interpret that. For uh, looking at this data, I think trust but verify to verify would mean to talk to the patient, examine the patient, get the story, um, mm -hmm. without necessarily jumping to another image to verify the imaging that was done at a transferring facility. Thank you. Nice presentation. Thank you. Thank I have you. to move on. I have to say these presentations make me feel like a true dinosaur, as somebody who still operates on a lot of patients without any imaging of any kind. But I know this is becoming extinct. <laughs> okay. Our next presentation is reducing blood draws in pediatric patients with solid organ injury through protocolized transcutaneous hemoglobin monitoring. It will be presented by Dr. Arya Payan uh, from Ventura County Medical Center in California. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, so we did this study uh, to reduce unnecessary blood draws in pediatric patients with solid organ injury, and I want to uh, present it to introduce a creative way to use technology, which you may already have at your facilities, um, to address a common clinical program, uh, a clinical problem in children's surgery. Transcutaneous hemoglobin monitoring may be an important tool to include in the APSA solid organ injury pathway to safely reduce blood draws and improve patient outcomes. I have no disclosures. Non-surgical management of pediatric solid organ injuries has significantly involved. In 2000, 
APSA published consensus guidelines on resource utilization for treatment of children with isolated solid organ injury. And then over the next 20 or so years, the treatment of solid organ injuries has continued to move further away from operative intervention. And a 2019 follow-up study established the importance of injury guideline effectiveness and significantly reducing ICU and hospital length of stay. Despite these advances, wide variations in care of pediatric solid organ injury still exist, specifically in the number and timing of blood draws. Transcutaneous hemoglobin monitoring, which I'm going to abbreviate TCHM moving forward, has been shown to be a safe and effective way to monitor hemoglobin levels in these, in these patients. When used in a protocolized fashion, TCHM may virtually eliminate the need for serial blood draws in most pediatric solid organ injuries. We sought to investigate this via a single center retrospective chart review cohort study of trauma patients admitted to a tertiary children's hospital with solid organ injuries. A laboratory hemoglobin value was obtained at the time of admission with additional uh, measurements obtained based on injury grading. We had two cohorts. The first is the 2015 Care Pathway cohort, which consisted of patients admitted between June and December of 2015 who underwent TCHM but were not treated with a blood draw reducing algorithm as is said in this top algorithm, as you can see. The second group is a 2020 Care Pathway group, which consisted of patients admitted between January of 2020 and December of 2022 who underwent TCHM with the intent to reduce post-injury blood draws via a blood draw reducing algorithm as can be seen in the lower table. We then tracked adverse events, which includes central or arterial line placement, blood product administration, percutaneous embolization procedures, transfer to the pediatric ICU, and any operative intervention. A total of 96 patients were included in the study. No significant differences were observed in distribution of sex, average age, BMI, race, or ethnicity. No, no children require percutaneous embolization or transfer to the PICU in the 2015 group, so unfortunately statistical differences couldn't not be calculated. More, oh, pardon, pardon. More broadly, no statistical differences are found between the two groups for surgical intervention, invasive line placement, or blood product administration. Of note, there was a higher but not statistically significant percentage of patients who required surgery during hospitalization in the 2020 cohort, but upon a deeper dive, it was noted that only three of these were for control of hemorrhage, while the rest were orthopedic related. Lastly, here's a comparison of the clinical outcomes for subjects. Length of stay, initial admission location, discharge disposition, and readmission rate within 30 days were not significantly different. Only the number of laboratory hemoglobin measurements significantly differed between the 2015 and 2020 cohorts with a P of 0.02. Of note, while overall length of stay did not significantly change, there was an absolute reduction in the median number of hours of hospitalization in the 2020 cohort. And this highlights the potential for reducing nursing and hospital census burden as hourly variation and admission times have significant impact on healthcare costs. Oh, I apologize. So in concluding, um, TCHM safely reduced the need for serial blood draws in pediatric trauma patients when utilized within a well-defined protocol for solid organ injury. And further studies are needed to evaluate the role of TCHM in shortening or even eliminating hospital admission for low-grade solid organ injuries in children. Importantly, because there was no increase in adverse events, what could question the utility of any additional blood draws and reduce the period of enforced bed rest? TCHM may be an important tool to safely study this. I'd like to thank uh, my team at Helen DeVos Children's Hospital, and most importantly, uh, Dr. Durkin, my PI for the project. Thank you. Thank you. Paper's open for questions. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Valley Children's Hospital, Jim Pierce. Um, uh, one of the questions I have is, we know with EPOC, for example, it's off by one. I was wondering if you looked at all at the group of patients who went to the operating room for orthopedic surgery, who had a predictable drop in hemoglobin, and you got a post-op hemoglobin, how good was TCHM at predicting how far it went down? And if I was running a patient in the operating room and I had this going on in the back like the pulse ox, how far would it have to drop before I knew we had to resend an epoch and get ready to send blood? So we did not look at the pre and post operative times um, and how the transcutaneous hemoglobin monitoring changed at that time, but there are published studies showing its use in the operating room and it's a real time um, change uh, in the hemoglobin level. So in theory, you could see it right away. Please. Katie Flynn O'Brien, Children's Wisconsin. Great presentation. I just want to challenge you on not measuring it at all. 
and follow hemodynamics instead. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, absolutely. That's ultimately the goal here. Um, and we're not saying transcutaneous hemoglobin monitoring needs to be in every single hospital in the United States. I'm saying that it's a, something that we can use as a potential stopgap until we further reduce or eliminate this. And maybe we can get to the day where we maybe draw one level. Or maybe in the ER you put a monitor on and you just monitor transcutaneously and then discharge your patients without you know, enforced hospital bed rest admission or even a reduced one with just a monitor. Jessica Nadish from Austin, Texas, Dell Children's. Congratulations on your work. It's a great study. Decreasing re resource utilization is obviously very important. Um, my question is basically a follow up on hers. Have you looked at these levels and how they've changed your management or not um, and moving towards just not checking them? Yeah. So we, we, the, we did not statistically look, investigate that, but anecdotally, especially as and I, uh, I see an intensivist, not a surgeon, I can say it did change my, what I did. I, it's one more piece of data that I just, when a nurse calls me to bedside, I can just look at it and see um, if that number has changed on the monitor. Of course, you still look clinically at the patient and that'll change what you do, um, but hopefully it will garner some confidence in our, in the, as a partnership between intensivists and surgeons so that we can all be on the same page um, and change the uh, protocol, protocolization going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Dr. Carrie McKee, a surgery resident from Boston Children's Hospital. She'll be presenting association of prophylactic antibiotic use with outcomes in infants undergoing pyloromyotomy. Members and guests, thank you for the opportunity to present our work. We have no disclosures. First, why we did this research. The incidence of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is estimated between two to five per 1,000 infants. Pyloromyotomy is considered a clean procedure without entry into the GI tract. However, variation exists among pediatric surgeons in the perceived utility of prophylactic antibiotics. Second, why are we presenting this today? This variation has largely been driven by the lack of consensus guidelines and rigorous comparative effectiveness data exploring outcomes with prophylaxis use. With these considerations, the goal of the present study was to compare the rate of surgical site infections in infants undergoing pyloromyotomy who received and did not receive antimicrobial prophylaxis. To address this study question, we conducted a retrospective multicenter cohort analysis of infants undergoing pyloromyotomy using data from the 2021 and 2022 American College of Surgeons NISQIP Pediatric General and Antibiotic Prophylaxis Participant Use Files, or PUFs. The NISQIP Pediatric General PUF includes a broad array of patient level and outcomes data, including surgical site infections, while the Antibiotic Prophylaxis PUF includes data on the type of agent, antibiotic agent used, the administration timeline, and the duration of use. Data from both files were merged for the present analysis. All NISQIP pediatric data are collected by dedicated surgical clinical reviewers using standardized criteria and data abstraction methodology. To compare outcomes between groups of patients who did and did not receive prophylaxis, we first used propensity matching to balance groups on covariates that may be plausibly related to a higher likelihood of receiving prophylaxis or developing an SSI. These included age and days at time of surgery, history of prematurity, method of pyloromyotomy, laparoscopic versus open, and both ASA class and preoperative length of stay as surrogate measures of physiologic derangement at the time of presentation. The association between the use of prophylaxis and outcomes in this propensity match group was then explored using chi-score testing. This slide summarizes the patient level and operative characteristics of the entire study cohort. Over 4,100 patients undergoing pyloromyotomy were identified for potential propensity matching. The median age at operation was 35 days, greater than 84% of patients were male, and approximately 9% had a history of prematurity, with more than half of infants being categorized as ASA class two, suggestive of a mild physiologic derangement at time of presentation. Nearly 48% received prophylaxis, with cefazolin being by far the most frequently utilized antibiotic. The distribution of patient and operative characteristics in the two comparison groups before and after matching is presented in this slide, with the columns on the left representing the unmatched cohorts and the two columns on the right representing the matched cohorts. 
In the unmatched cohort, patient who, patients who received antibiotics were more likely to be younger at the time of operation, were less likely to have a history of prematurity, had overall lower physiologic derangement based on ASA classification, and were more likely to undergo open surgery. Following matching, no differences remained between groups in any patient or operative characteristics. The results of the analysis and the unmatched cohort, including all of the patients in the study, is presented in this slide. The overall SSI rate was 1.4%, and no differences were found in either surgical site infection or readmission rates in those that did and did not receive prophylaxis. Finally, the results of the propensity match cohort are presented here, which includes over 1,700 patients in each group. After balancing on all covariates, no clinically or statistically relevant differences were found in surgical inf site infection rates between groups, with a rate of 1.3% in patients receiving prophylaxis and a rate of 1.7% in those that did not. Similarly, no differences were found for readmission rates between the groups. The results of this study must be considered in the context of its limitations. Data were retrospectively collected, and errors in misclassification of exposures and outcomes are possible despite measures used by NISQIP to ensure data integrity. Hospital-level identifiers are not available in the NISQIP pediatric participant use files, therefore limiting the ability to adjust for event clustering among hospitals. However, given the homogeneity of the study population, low baseline SSI rate, and nearly 50-50 split in the use of antibiotics, it is unlikely that adjustment for clustering would have influenced this analysis. Finally, the analysis was limited to Nisquit pediatric hospitals, which may limit the generalizability of these results to other hospitals. In conclusion, surgical site infections are relatively rare following pyloromyotomy, and the risk of this complication was not reduced with the use of prophylactic antibiotics. We would therefore recommend against the routine use of antibiotic prophylaxis in infants undergoing pyloromyotomy. We would like to thank the program committee for the opportunity to present our work. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Well, I guess you did an excellent job because there are no questions. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you so much, everyone. Right. We're right on time, and we're going to end where we started with Cohen Children's Hospital. Dr. Barry Rich will present factors associated with delay to care in pediatric and adolescent and next torsion, a multi-institutional review. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to present our work. We have no disclosures. The diagnosis of adnexal torsion is challenging due to the variable clinical presentation and often inconclusive imaging results. We did this research to test our hypothesis that delays in diagnosis of adnexal torsion are common, which may lead to prolonged ischemia and subsequent tissue loss. This work is important because if we can identify factors that help lead to, this, to a delay, perhaps we can help minimize this and minimize any complications. So we therefore performed a multi-institutional study from the Delivery of Surgical Care Committee of the surgical section of the AAP. And we included all patients, all female patients aged five to 18 years with confirmed adnexal torsion in the operating room over a 10 year period. This was a retrospective chart review and included 10 children's hospitals across the United States. We defined a delay in diagnosis as either discharge from the emergency room within seven days prior to the OR admission and or admission to the hospital without the initial intention of going to the operating room. We, resulted, we identified 865 patients with 35% of them being less than 12 years of age. Approximately half of the patients were white and 38% lived nearby to the hospital within one to 10 miles, and that's the hospital of the operation, where almost one quarter of the patients lived greater than 30 miles from the hospital. 
Area Deprivation Index, as we heard earlier, is a validated marker of socioeconomic disparity and is often used in a lot of different healthcare applications. The, high, the most affluent neighborhoods have the lowest ADI with uh, the lowest deprivation, and the poorest neighborhoods have the highest ADI with the, um, the high, most highest deprivation. And we used a national percentile ADI reflecting the national, uh, lo the wide variety of locations of the hospitals included. Almost 40% were transferred from an outside hospital, and patients presented most commonly with pain and tenderness and emesis. And almost all patients had a pelvic ultrasound for diagnosis, with uh, less percentages having three-dimensional imaging. Almost all patients were operated on by a pediatric surgeon. Almost half of torsions were ovarian in nature, 14% tubal, and 30% both where 82% of them had a lead point at the time of the operation. And importantly, nine and a half, we had an overall rate of 9.5% of ophorectomy and 13% salpingectomy. There was a 30% rate of delay of diagnosis. Most of this was in the form of discharge from the emergency room, almost three quarters whereas almost 20% were admitted to the hospital without going initially to the operating room, and 8.5% had both. A delay in diagnosis resulted in an increased rate of ophorectomy of 13.5% in the delay group versus, I'm sorry, 13% in the delay group versus 7.5% in the non-delay group. Uh, there were similar rates of salpingectomy. So patients without a delay were more likely to have at their initial ER visit more emesis and pain, and they were more likely to have a consultation by a pediatric surgeon of 91% versus 28% in the delay group. Interestingly, 44% with the delay were transferred from an outside hospital, which was different than 35% of those without a delay. On their initial pelvic ultrasound, patients without a delay were more likely to have peripheralization of follicles, diminished flow to the ovary, a twisted pedicle, and a read of their ultrasound by a pediatric radiologist of 79% in the non-delay group versus 49% in the delay group. Um, almost over, just over half of our patients had follow-up after their operation, and there was no difference whether this was in the delay group or the non-delay group, but interestingly, this was associated with insurance status. Almost all of these patients had pelvic ultrasound, and 70% had normal bilateral ovaries seen on their follow-up imaging. But interestingly, 16 patients, if their preserved, their preserved torsed ovary was not visualized, and this was more likely in the delayed group than the non-delayed group. 18 patients, the preserved torus ovary was visualized, but smaller and or atrophic, but this was not different, different between the two groups. And interestingly, uh, 80 pa almost 80 patients in the torus ovary, they had visualization of a recurrent cyst or mass, and that was not different in the groups. So in our multivariable analysis, we identified that area deprivation index and distance from the hospital were both associated with a delay of diagnosis. For every one unit increase in ADI, the odds of experiencing a delay increases by 1.3%. And the odds of experiencing a delay was 81% greater for patients living more than 30 miles from the hospital compared to those living 1 to 10 miles. So in conclusion, we identified that delays in diagnosis are common, and this most likely is secondary to the fact that it's difficult to make the diagnosis. We saw that those patients that had more severe symptoms and those that had more concerning ultrasound findings, not surprisingly, were the ones that did not have a delay and went to the operating room. But it's the ones that had more subtle symptoms or more subtle findings on ultrasound where there was a delay. There have been recent publications looking at composite scores to try to help us with diagnosis and some preliminary work looking at contrast-enhanced ultrasound. 
Um, certainly, we have to do better with our diagnosis because our delay rate is quite high. And as we've identified, there are some significant implications to this with increased tissue loss, whether that's in the operating room with ophorectomy or perhaps even on follow-up with loss of the visualized ovary. We also identified that delays in diagnosis are associated with uh, social determinants of health, and it's critical that we have a better understanding and an awareness of this because um, certainly we can do better in identifying um, the um, risk factors for this population for an exotorsion. So thank you very much, and I um, look forward to any questions. We have time for a question or two. Steve. Hi, Stephen Lee, Seattle Children's. Great presentation, great Thank findings. You. Two quick questions. One is correlating to the previous um, study about repeating imaging. Did those coming from an outside hospital have repeat imaging? So it's a good question. <clears throat> um, we didn't exactly look at that, but what I will say is that we didn't include in our analysis if there was no data from the initial hospital. So we only. Uh, all comers were involved, included in the analysis for the delays and the rates of ophorectomy, but I did not include that data that was not known. So either it was known from the outside hospital and or repeated at the new hospital to be included in the analysis. So there were 80 patients minus 865 that were not included in the ultrasound and imaging comparison. So those were excluded if we didn't have that information. And just real curious, um, if you don't delay and you go straight to the operating room on clinical parameters, you may actually have an increased risk of finding a non, uh, a, not a torsion or something else that's causing the pain. What was the negative rate of torsion in those that were not delayed? So it's a great question. So in order to be included, you had to have a diagnosis of a nexal torsion. That was the only way for us to know what the true rate of delay of diagnosis is. So we did not include patients that were just a rule out and ended up not having it. So these were all 865 confirmed. But previous work that um, my group has done and others have repeated is that we've seen high as a 40 to 50 percent rate of negative diagnostic laparoscopy rate for an exotorsion. torsion. So we're way, we're, that's a balance, right? The missed diagnosis, like appendicitis, like we've talked about, and then the negative diagnostic laparoscopy rate, um, you know, 40 to 50% seems very high. It's higher than appendicitis, of course, but the implications of missing it are greater as well. So it's a great question. Great work, thanks. Thank you. That brings us to the end of this session. I just want to thank all the presenters for really amazing, thought-provoking studies. Dr. Castilla, my um, co, this is the first time I've co-moderated a session with one of our fellows. It's a real privilege. It was a pleasure. And just thank you all for the wonderful attendance today. Have a great lunch. <laughs>